Hello and welcome to this PA invited address. My name is Annalisa Ventola. I'm the executive director of the Parapsychological Association and I'm gonna be your host for this event. Uh, before we start and as we wait for, for people to come in, uh, I just wanna point out a few features of this virtual space. Um, and that's for the people who are PA members who are here at AirMeet with us. Uh, to the right, you're gonna see a column with the names of attendees and down below their business cards. Um, please use the question section to ask questions during the talk. Um, and you, you can see that there's a little question mark in a bubble there. Um, we recommend that we, you use this section instead of the chat. Um, you can also upvote a question uh, that has already been asked to help me as the host pick the most popular questions uh, for Jeff if we don't have enough time. Uh, if you are camera ready, at the end of this talk, you will be invited to raise your hand using the raised hand feature. Uh, and at that point, you'll be invited to join the stage with our speaker and time permitting, ask your question directly. Uh, do keep in mind that this session is being recorded and it's being broadcast live. Uh, at the bottom of the screen, you will also see some reaction buttons. And that is, uh, that's something we encourage you to use. Uh, this is a good way to give feedback to your speaker. So for example, you can give a thumbs up or applaud, or I like the laughter button myself. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so please just give a thumbs up or applaud as you see fit. So today it is my great pleasure uh, to present the 2020 PA Outstanding Contribution Award uh, to Professor Jeffrey J. Kripal. And this is the award which will be making its way into the mail this week. Uh, this yearly award is given to someone who has made outstanding research or service contributions that have advanced the discipline of parapsychology. This award recognizes Professor Kripal's ongoing oeuvre around eroticism, mystical literature, and the paranormal which brings singular and thought-provoking input to the whole field of parapsychology through the art and practice of comparison. Uh, Jeff is the Associate Dean for Faculty and Graduate Studies in the School of Humanities at Rice University. He is also the J. Newton Razor Professor of Religion. He is the author of numerous books, most recently, The Flip, Who You Really Are and Why It Matters, and he is pretty sure that he is Spider-Man. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to invite Professor Kreipel to take it away. Thank you, Annalisa. Um, I want to just begin with just a few words. First of all, I want to say to uh, Annalisa that, you know, I've known you for five or six years now. I've been at these meetings. I've been following things developing, and it's really, it's really an extraordinary development over the years. It's, it's a really classy organization. I don't mean to say it wasn't before, but it's really you really upped the game. I think it's quite extraordinary, and I think somebody needs to say that in public. So I just said it. Thank you so much, Jeff. Yeah. Um, I'm going to read my lecture um, just because I've found that it's much easier to give people substance. Um, if I try to get too casual, it just gets casual and cute, and you don't get much out of it. If I stick to the text, you I think you'll get some substance, and then we can talk um, casually as much as you want. I, I'm not afraid of talking casually, but I really do want to deliver the lecture. It's it's actually quite short. It's just 11 pages long. It, it, it should take about the 30 minutes. Um, before I begin, I, I want to explain what I'm trying to do. Um, I'm, I'm a humanist, by which... I don't mean in the philosophical sense, I mean in the educational sense. I work in a school of humanities. I actually work in a dean's office these days, thinking about the humanities as a whole. And I think a lot about parapsychology, actually, and how to bring it in to the disciplines. So some of this is going to sound maybe a bit nerdy, uh, maybe it's a bit too academic for you, but please understand what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get... Um, my colleagues and my professional peers to take seriously the things that parapsychologists do and to try to explain to them why it's really so terribly important. Okay, so let me begin. The talk is called The Superhumanities, and it begins with uh, an epi epigraph from um, the notebooks, the Naklas, the unpublished notebooks of Friedrich Nietzsche. And it reads, I live so that I know. I want to know so that superhumans may live. 
we experiment for them. We might think of the sciences as disciplined forms of knowledge concerned with the behavior of material or objective reality, with the number or mathematics as the privileged symbolic medium. On the other hand, we might think of the humanities as disciplined forms of knowledge concerned with the expressions of mental reality or forms of consciousness coded in culture, with the text or narrative as the privileged symbolic medium. So object and subject, number and narrative, cosmos and consciousness. Once we understand our present order of knowledge in this doubled way, it becomes immediately obvious why parapsychology has had such a difficult time fitting into that order of knowledge. It occupies by necessity both the material and mental dimensions of human experience. And its most prized phenomena, in fact, collapse this distinction <clears throat> sometimes entirely. My present coinage of the superhumanities is another attempt to encourage and develop this uncanny collapse, to propose a humanistic science or a scientific humanism. For the sake of the present lecture, however, allow me to focus more on something more basic. That is on how the superhumanities might emerge from the humanities side of things. To put things too simply, but perhaps instructively, by the superhumanities, I mean something that already exists. I mean to point to a fantastic but forgotten dimension of the humanities, which consists of the catalytic presence of altered states of mind and energy that have driven the creative processes of some of our most revered authors, artists, and activists. Think Immanuel Kant's private letters expressing shock and awe at the clairvoyance of Emanuel Swedenborg, whom he chose to mock and make fun of in public print. Think Hegel's interest in hermetic spirituality and his own contemporary mesmerism and magnetism. Think Schopenhauer's empirical experience of precognitive dream. Think William James's well-known psychical researches and personal experiments with nitrous oxide, diethyl ether, and peyote to access other states of consciousness. And think W.E.B. Du Bois's invocation of occult tropes and themes from double consciousness to the fourth dimension in order to theorize race and class in American society. Or closer to our own present, think of Jacques Derrida's late conversion to telepathy as the ultimate deconstruction of the subject. Michel Foucault's LSD trip in Death Valley, during which he was said to have seen the truth, capital T. Or think Gloria Anzaldúa's elaborate descriptions of her own possession states, out-of-body remote viewing, and experience of what she called the superhuman to theorize borders, mixed races, her own lesbian sexuality, and what we today call post-colonial theory. The list is long and breathless, and I could go on for my full 30 minutes here, dropping names and describing apparently outrageous ideas, all of which these authors took perfectly seriously. But I will not. I wanna say something simpler and then I want to say something more complex with respect to a single figure within these superhuman histories. On the simple side, I want to say that the superhumanities are nothing more and nothing less than the humanities themselves, now acknowledged and celebrated as astonishing. The superhumanities are the Superman to Clark Kent of the humanities the weird crashed alien to the dull, bespeckled human in the office. Same guy, different costume. There is a less mythical way to say the same. I do not believe for one second that some of the most impactful, really world-changing ideas of the humanities emerged from thinking, much less cognitive, logical, or linear thought. 
I think they emerged from altered states of knowledge and energy that they were experienced as given. They crash landed. We do not think we are thought. A corollary follows to the extent that we reduce or restrict the humanities to these strictly conscious and intentional rational or cognitive modes, we will make them culturally irrelevant, intellectually boring and spiritually insignificant. We will destroy them. Such a positing of the humanities as already the superhumanities is a development of the thesis of others, including that of Jason A. Josephson Storm, that the human sciences and the sciences, by the way, have always been enchanted and that the constant claim that modernity is somehow mythless, that it arose by a rejection of animism, magic, myth, and the paranormal is simply false. The claim of absence is itself a myth, the purest myth of all in some sense, the myth that there is no myth. Such a constantly touted but deeply mistaken claim goes back to the German psychologist Max Weber and his famous argument in accompanying phrase, die Entzauberung der Welt, the disenchantment of the world, or what Josephson Storm has called the denaturing of the world. It never happened, not in any complete or accomplished sense anyway. Often, indeed, if we really look at intellectual history in a single room, as Josephson Storm has it, quote, we can find both seance and science, unquote. And so his book begins in Paris in 1907 with Madame Curie, the double Nobel Prize winner in physics and chemistry, who discovered radiation, and her husband, Pierre, attending a seance with the Italian super medium, Usapia Palladino. Usapia was a kind of occult nuclear reactor in her own right. The attendants witnessed up close and personal luminous points around Palladino's head and a, what was called a glowing luminescence that the medium ran through Madame Curie's own hair. Pierre was blunt enough, quote, in my opinion, there is here a whole domain of completely new facts and physical states of space about which we have had no conception, unquote. Note the graphic empiricism. Marie was, was similarly forthcoming, and I quote, personally, I am quite willing to accept the existence of unusual powers in mediums such as usapia, unquote. In Josephson Storm's opening volley then, Madame Curie, quote, was conjuring ghosts or studying paranormal manifestations as part of her physics research, unquote. So were a long line of founding humanist, social scientific, and scientific authors with respect to their own researches. And so Josephson Storm shows us how, quote, the human sciences, in German, the Geisteswissenschaften, the sciences of the spirit, literally, emerged as academic disciplines in the 19th century alongside flourishing theosophical and spiritualist movements and shared the latter's fascination with magical knowledge and the spirits of the dead. Unquote. In show, in, I'm sorry, in short, there is an, quote, occult side of the human sciences, unquote, that has been forgotten or actively repressed. That is precisely what I intend by the phrase, the superhumanities. Okay, next section called the most spiritual Nietzsche. Now allow me to say something a bit more complex this time with respect to a single iconic figure within this superhuman history. The basic idea of the superhumanities orbits around a specific German seer, the inimitable Friedrich Nietzsche. Enter the enigmatic future human <clears throat> or Ubermensch. Traditionally from 1905 on, the Superman in American English, but more recently and probably accurately rendered soup the superhumans. Such a collective being or superspecies was seen and prophesized by the ecstatic German philosopher in his final years, but particularly in his Thus Spoke Zarathustra, which was published in 1884. The book would be ignored in the author's time and by his own assessment, profoundly misheard. 
or rather not heard at all. Still, it would eventually become one of the best-selling and most read philosophical works of all time. Let that sink in. This publishing tidbit is no tangential factoid. It is an uncanny sign of our modern world, and particularly of that branch of higher education known, but not really known, as the humanities, where the text is commonly read and widely revered, and just as commonly dismissed or condemned to this day. Nietzsche certainly knew he would not be understood. In one of the more humorous but instructive images of his unpublished notebooks, he would write that he is strolling around above our heads on the next floor up. We could not stand this, so we put, quote, wood and earth and refuse, unquote, between him and us, so as to muffle what he called the speech of his steps. As for the roof over his head, it, quote, begins in that place where all stairways end, unquote entirely beyond thought and experience itself, the open sky. Accordingly, one can hardly claim to have moved beyond Nietzsche before one has tried to understand him on his own terms and floor, and seriously considered whether he may have been right and oneself mistaken, or better, whether we may just be talking on different floors. Toward this end, I am presently reading as much of the Nietzschean corpus as I can, including the translated Naklas or notebooks written during and after the key Zarathustra period from the summer of 1881 to the philosopher's collapse in January of 1889. I have not found what I assumed I would find. I have not found an angry atheist or a naysaying nihilist much less a postmodern deconstructionist. I have found a godless mystical writer who described himself as, quote, the most spiritual, unquote, of human beings, and who openly described his deconstructive no-saying books, works like a genealogy, a genealogy of morals and beyond good and evil, as mere angelhaken, fish hooks, means to catch the reader for the vastly more important yes saying book of Thus Spoke Zarathustra and its twin teachings of eternal recurrence and the, and the coming Superman. Indeed, when all is said and done, Nietzsche wished, quote, to be only a yes sayer, unquote. The genealogies and deconstructions which he is most known today, in fact, were just warm up. What I found in actually reading Nietzsche, in other words, was that academics generally ignore, really reverse Nietzsche's own authorial intentions and ecstatic voice, and focus instead on our own depressing and nearsighted nihilisms and deconstructions. We refuse to look too far. We turn away from the seer's superhumanism and turn back to our own humanism. In Nietzschean terms, we, we choose to remain kleiner or puny. You think I am kidding. Allow me to quote for you just a few of Nietzsche's ecstatic claims to divinity. He used the word all the time, by the way, of which, please note, there are hundreds. I'm just going to obviously quote a, a, a few here. Allow me to begin with his well-known claim on the 6th of January, 1889, in a letter to Jakob Burkhardt that, quote, Jeder Nama in der Geschichte ich bin, I am all names in history. Taking the same claim further and sounding downright new age, he even wrote Wagner's widow around the same time to tell her that, quote, among the Indians I was Buddha and in Greece I was Dionysius. Alexander and Caesar are my incarnations, unquote. I know such lines are commonly dismissed by philosophers or read metaphorically or as signs of an approaching madness. Earlier American and British commentators described the final books where such lines are both foreshadowed and developed in great detail as, quote, the blasphemies of a mad atheist, unquote, and as, quote, the most insane portions of the work, unquote. 
Of course they did. But I take such final lines very seriously, indeed as perfectly plausible, which is not to say literally. I do so because I recognize them. In the end, I am most interested in what Jennifer Rotner Rosenhagen, alluding back to a very late letter of the philosopher, calls the post-Rubicon Nietzsche. The seer had indeed crossed over. The claim to be all names in history is a perfectly fine descriptor of a most radical idealism shining through the endless mass of ego and society. I do not read Nietzsche's ecstatic speech then as signs of impending madness, although that very neurological condition, I suspect, helped reveal or release them. I read such deified claims as perfectly accurate descriptions of a much greater form of consciousness that was bursting through the writer's deteriorating body and brain. I read them empirically and imaginally as perfectly honest descriptions of what he actually knew and that was so. Indeed, in this comparative light, such famous Nietzschean one-liners read rather humbly and not at all surprisingly. We can easily find other genres of ecstatic speech in comparative mystical literature, like the Muslim mystic Al-Bistami, who, who died in 874 in the Western calendar, who famously proclaimed, glory be to me, how great is my glory, unquote. Or Bistami's successor in ecstatic speech, Al-Halaj, who was crucified upside down, by the way, in the year 922, was said to have uttered phrases like, I am the truth, that is, I am God, and was crucified for such outrageous offenses to Islamic religions. Tired of deified men? Consider, consider the Christian mystic Catherine of Genoa, who died in 1510, who once described her most profound realization this way, and I quote, the proper center of every one is God himself. My me, which he capitalized, capital M, my me is God, nor do I recognize any other me except my God himself, unquote. This, of course, makes both Catherine and God, quote, all names in history, unquote. Exactly. So what do we do with Nietzsche's famous atheism and religion? <clears throat> I, I'm sorry. Nietzsche's famous atheism and irreligion, well, we understand them. What disgusted him most about religion is not its bold or extravagant claims, his were more so, but what he called its solemn toy trumpeters and dreary doctrines and lies. It was also all of that disgusting kneeling, the embodied groveling before an imaginary God made up by priests and rulers who wanted to control other people. I quote, your knees worship, but your heart knows nothing of it, unquote. Prayer, too, was a kind of whimpering. Such are what he called the habits of slaves. It is all just so small, so puny, he would say, with the utmost contempt. This is why it is so treasonous when someone strives for true greatness beyond the herd of religion. But most of all, religion is looking the wrong way. It is looking backwards to the past, not forward to the future. It is time to move on. The time has passed for human beings to nail themselves to the cross, he wrote, or to be hung there by some ghastly god who would call this love. When Nietzsche thought of incense then, he smelled a different kind of holy burning, heretics burning at the stake. The paradox of this denial of the religious past that is also a most radical affirmation of the spiritual future is captured in fragments like these. I quote, I am Zarathustra, the godless. Who speaks here? Who is more godless than I am, than I want to become his disciple? Or again, I want apostles, but not quiet corners and communities. People of faith, Nietzsche observed, do not hate free thinkers the most, but rather new thinkers that have a new faith. Indeed, the free thinker is, quote, the most religious person that now exists, unquote. In him, quote, God 
killed God, unquote. Not exactly your typical atheist. More like the ultimate teacher of being spiritual, but not religious. It should not surprise us. All of these astonishing ecstatic speech claims were a result of a revelation Nietzsche received in the summer of 1881. That is, his altered texts were expressions of altered states. To be more precise, Nietzsche's realization of the eternal recurrence of the same, which he claims to be uniquely given to him as a historical first, and to quote, be the most scientific of facts, unquote, came to the philosopher in August of 1881, just outside of Seals Maria, Switzerland. It happened near a large alpine boulder on the shores of Silva Plana Lake, quote, 6,000 feet above man and time, unquote, as he confessed the most significant moment is of life on a sheet of paper just after the event. The scribbled notation is interesting as it encodes both the teaching of the Superman, 6,000 feet above man, and the eternal recurrence of the same, 6,000 feet above time. It implicitly links the two teachings. Put a bit differently, it expresses a vision of both the future human and the superficiality of history as we normally think of the latter. And of course, the double image relies entirely on a symbolism of up or super, uber in, the, in Nietzsche's German. You can still go and look at the rock up there. It hasn't moved. Seems appropriate. Same rock. The next eight years would see a storm of writing to the day the philosopher fell into psychic oblivion on January 4th, 1889, in a plaza in Turin, Italy. For the astonished writer, these were eight years of awe, trying to write out a secret that he himself believed would change the course of human history. Indeed, that would help evolve humanity itself. Contrary to what many assume, Nietzsche claimed an actual encounter with the empirical, circular nature of temporality and the furthest reaches of human being. He was making a claim on the real, out of the altered states of his own body and mind, and he was encoding those altered states in his altered texts. This is why so many readers to this day have found themselves in a state of awe or near enlightenment reading these same books. Such readers are genuinely grokking that elevation of consciousness secreted in the Nietzschean texts. They too are being lifted up to the floor above us where Nietzsche knocks around and laughs. Next section is called Nietzsche the Precog. Nietzsche was also a precog and a paranormal prodigy. Let me be more historical here. Nietzsche did not have the word paranormal. As far as we can tell at the moment, it was coined in 1903 by a French scientist and lawyer, Joseph Maxwell, no doubt after the earlier English supernormal of Frederick Myers. Both terms attempted the same intellectual work. They attempted to naturalize the supernatural and located square, squarely within, not outside, the natural order. Paranormal, paranormal in the French, after all, means to the side of the normal. It's meant to signal what is normal but not yet understood or recognized in the present sciences. Such a sensibility is perfectly Nietzschean. As the writer put a similar idea in his notebooks, quote, we do not believe in many things, only because we do not believe in the conventional way they are explained, unquote. That is the generous sensibility that Maxwell was trying to get at with his new word, paranormal. Nietzsche certainly did not make this mistake of not believing what he could not explain. Contrary to the received image of the writer, he was extremely gifted in just these worlds and words, and he wrote about his own anomalous experiences extensively. Words like uncanny, eerie, omen, clairvoyant, sixth sense, premonition, eternal, divinatory, strange, divine, prophet, saint, mystic, soul, even miraculous, demon, and God occur often and in ecstatically positive ways. 
To cite a single example, again, there are hundreds of these. Consider this one. Now I am clairvoyant. My diamond sword cuts every darkness to pieces. For too long, I was obsessed with clairvoyance." Unquote. Along the same lines, it is important to recall that Nietzsche accepted what he called spiritistic phenomena as quite real, but read them as unconscious communication, often unconscious even to the medium, as we have seen as functions of a palpable electrical current, as he called it, passing from the medium into the participants of the seance, often, as he noted, with very real physical effects. The paranormal details just go on and on and on in the Nietzschean text. What are we to do, for example, with Nietzsche's claim to smell souls, to possess, quote, a perfectly uncanny sensitivity so that the proximity, or what am I saying, the inmost parts, the entrails of every soul, are physiologically perceived by me, smelled, unquote. This, he claims, acts as a kind of, quote, psychological antennae with which I feel and get a hold of every secret. The abundant hidden dirt at the bottom of many a character enters my consciousness almost at first contact. True enough, we could entertain ourselves with the easy notion that the philosopher was just being poetic or rhetorical that he was somehow writing about picking up subtle physical cues, writing about intuition, as we say, we could easily enough reduce the man to our own banality, read him through our own secular postmodern prejudices. We could say that this something that sets this man apart was his overweening confidence, his arrogance, which he himself noted and called divine, or perhaps his theological collapse that made him say all those outrageous things, none of which, of course, are really true, none of which he, we are asked to believe, believed. We could lower himself, we could lower him to ourselves. Or if we wanted to be more neutral and nicer, we could point to the writer's absolute conviction and the centrality of his ideas in person and confidently say that he, got, he just got lucky that every other professional writer, of course, thinks something like this, and a very few of them, of course, turn out to be right. Still, none of these rational responses really get is at what is at work within, or perhaps better, above these uncanny texts, what Nietzsche often described as the lightning bolts of his words hurled into unknown futures. Certainly words like arrogance and madness seem much too tame and frankly lame. I mean, can we really call lines like why I am a destiny or Nietzsche's constant re refrain that his books and ideas were of world historical importance, simply arrogance? Most of all, what professional reader of Nietzsche really acknowledges the historical fact that, well, he was right. Nietzsche did in fact predict and with great accuracy the future effects and global influence of his own writings in person. And this despite the other fact that his books were basically utter flops in his own life. If we did not know better, we might think the man actually saw the future that he was writing about. Maybe he did. Parts of it anyway. Nietzsche often reveled in the fact that he was among those, quote, premature births of an as yet unproven future that he belonged to, quote, an as yet undiscovered country whose boundaries nobody has surveyed yet. Still, at least some hills and valleys of this undiscovered country have been enthusiastically surveyed since Nietzsche wrote those lines in 1888. We call such uber phenomena paranormal or parapsychological and try to catch their various impossible expressions under abstract Greek letters like psi, or, for the truly literate, super psi. Such, of course, are academically difficult expressions, intellectually damned words, rejected pseudo-expressions that fit into no established order of knowledge. Take pre phenomena. Each of new things, knew such things personally and wrote about them as a simple fact of his life. In 1851, for example, as a 13-year-old boy, 
He dreamed of his recently deceased father emerging from a grave, going into a church, and returning into the grave mound with a child in his arms. I quote Nietzsche, On the day that followed this night, little Joseph, his younger brother, suddenly fell ill, seized by severe cramps, and after a few hours he died. Our grief knew no bounds. My dream had been fulfilled completely. Unquote. Such a moment is impossible, of course, within our conventional understandings of time. It cannot happen. Or if it does manage to happen as it did here, it can be nothing but an intuition, what Nietzsche would call a puny word, or perhaps a coincidence, punier still, a statistical blip in the heartless random order of meaningless dead things, puniest of all. Although you would hardly know it from the most of the humanist and scientific discourses of this much abused topic, we of course know a great deal about precognitive phenomena from over two centuries of impressive parapsychological, medical, scientific, philosophical, and popular literatures. We also know that such future seeings are seldom perfect, much less always reliable. Seers, diviners, and precogs get some things very right and get other things very wrong. Freud, a clear inheritor of Nietzsche, by the way, taught us that a related superphenomena, telepathy, or what he called thought transference, commonly works in unconscious, overdetermined, symbolic, and associative ways, like a dream. We know from contemporary writers like the anthropologist Eric Wargo that precognition works through very similar psychoanalytic processes of unconscious translation and internal censorship, often as a dream reaching back from the near future, exactly as we saw above with Little Friedrich's dream. Or in the waking day now as an adult, in this obviously precognitive line, Nietzsche would write, quote, I once sensed the proximity of a herd of cows even before I saw it, merely because milder and more philanthropic thoughts came back to me. They had warmth. That's something that precognition names happen all the time, usually unbidden, especially to gifted writers and people in danger, distress, or death, or falling into madness. Something just opens them up to a greater spatial and temporal. They become antennae of reality as it really is, not as we think it is in our local languages and adaptive but grossly limited brain-based cognitions. The topic of precognition, in other words, is no tangential matter. It has everything to do with the isness of nat or nature of time itself, which just happens to be the subject of Nietzsche's final teaching of eternal recurrence. And now my conclusion, which is very, very short. <laughs> it's called Not So Super. I should finally add after this exercise that I am not claiming such extraordinary experiences for myself. Nietzsche strolls above my head, too. But I am claiming that the history of human civilization sparks and spikes with exactly these kinds of impossible superhuman states. That indeed, those global and local histories make no sense at all without them. I am also claiming that many of the canonical figures of the humanities had or were these states as well. Finally, I am also claiming that to the extent that, that we do not have, or perhaps more practically, cannot imagine such imp impossible experiences, we cannot and will not understand these founding figures or what they have gifted us. We will underestimate vastly the humanities because we will not see that they are also the superhumanities and as such involve both the mental and material dimensions of our cosmic existence. That's my point. That's what the present project is about. Finally, let me say this. As an aging academic who usually does not feel very super, there is an understatement. I am quite certain that I am wrong about any number of things. I don't care. We don't have time for being right about everything. The important thing is to get the ideas out there. My colleagues, students, and readers can then agree or disagree with these ideas, reject them, correct them, nuance them, 
or develop them further. They are the future superhumans to whom I look forward, for whom I experiment, and for whom I want to know. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Jeff. That was wonderful. Um, we're going to now begin our Q&A section. Um, uh, please raise your hand if you would like to be invited to the stage. Um, and remember, too, that we are uh, broadcasting this currently to YouTube um, as well as recording. So uh, do, do keep that in mind if you raise your hand. Um, and then you can also use the questions feature. And I will ask the question on your behalf. And it looks like we already have a few questions in the question feature. So uh, I'm going to start with a question from Paul H. Smith. Uh, he's asking, what is the final destination for this paper? Um, well, it has a couple destinations, Paul. What, one is a, what I hope is a little book. You know, you hope for little books, then you write big books. But it, it's just called The Superhumanities. And it's an attempted intervention into the conversation in higher education about the, what the humanities are. Um, but with the Nietzsche material, that's much more extensive and much more complicated. And I hope to make that the kind of the heart of the first, first volume of a trilogy I'm working on called The Super Story, um, by which I mean the way the sciences are changing our modern mythologies and the way modern people live in a, in a scientific cosmos and no longer in a religious one. And I think Nietzsche in many ways is the kind of the origin point of the super story, particularly around the evolving Superman and the um, circular nature of time. All right, so Paul had both uh, asked a question in the question box and raised his hand. So uh, I, I've passed him the mic in case there's anything else he wants to follow up on. Paul, do you want to join us? Sure. Um, are we doing camera too, or just? Uh, yes, you're welcome to. Okay, I, I don't care, but it does seem a little weird to be a a, a billboard here instead of a, a person. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, my question was: uh, early on, you went through a, a a list of people in the humanities, quite prominently known in philosophy, etc., who expressed an interest or an affinity for parapsychology. Um, some of them surprising, actually. Um, I just wondering if you're familiar with the final breakup of Carnap and Wittgenstein and how that came to be. You know, Jason, 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 Jason Joseph Jones Jones talks Jones about Wittgenstein in his book. I'm not, I'm not familiar with that story. Well, you know, Wittgenstein, this is kind of esoterical in the philosophical world, but Wittgenstein started off as being a mystic thanks to his association with Schopenhauer. And then he abandoned it. He became a, apparently a full-blown physicalist, uh, as far as could be told for sure, since his knocklost was burnt, you know, <laughs> astonishingly, that his, his uh, successor actually obeyed those wishes. But, um, but he was visiting Carnap one day, um, who, who's a prominent, for folks who don't know, he's a prominent uh, logical empiricist back in the 30s, part of the Vienna Circle. And... Wittgenstein discovered a book on parapsychology on Carnap's shelf and was irate about it. And Carnap essentially, I'm reading between the lines a little bit, refused to reject the idea that there might be something to it. It wasn't necessarily that Carnap was a, a believer in parapsychology. It's that he was not a disbeliever, and he, I think he felt it was irresponsible philosophically to reject it as a possibility. But Carnap, or I'm sorry, Wittgenstein had gotten really almost belligerent about the subject. And so... Uh, to my understanding, they actually never communicated again because of that. So, yeah, um, it's in one of the books. I, I, I have the reference somewhere. I don't remember right now, but maybe if you're interested in, in further details, I'll find out where it came from. Well, you know, so J.J. discusses Carnap and Wittgenstein in his book, The Myth of Disillusionment. Okay. Or The Myth of Disenchantment, I'm sorry. And, uh, I, again, I don't know that story. I I, um, but I, it, it sounds totally in line with what, what you'd expect. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Paul. And let me take away the mic. Pardon me. Okay, so uh, back to the Q&A. Um, 
there's been some new ones. <laughs> uh, I'm going to give you a, a tougher one, then we'll get into the easier ones. <laughs> uh, so Brand Brandon Fenton asks, how might this superhumanism relate to the kind of posthumanism or the turning away from the anthropos that has arisen more recently? For example, in the works of thinkers like Donna Haraway, Luce uh, Irigaray, and others. Yeah, you know, th that's a super important question that I haven't really thought through. So I have a I have a colleague here at Rice named Kerry Wolf, who's a who's a student of Donna Haraway's. Um, so I'm I'm close to Haraway's work through Kerry, and he he edits a series called The Post Humanities. I would say the post-humanities are attempting to break down distinctions between the human species and, and other species. Um, and, you know, there's also the transhumanist movement, which is attempting essentially to fuse silicon-based technologies and, and carbon-based technologies, i.e. our body. I think what I'm calling, the, what I'm calling superhuman humanism or the superhumanities are much more organic, frankly, than that. Um, much more biological, um, certainly not dependent on technology like posthumanism or tra transhumanism, and but probably related to post the posthumanist impulse to see the human species as you know part of a larger ecological network. You know Nietzsche famously said he fa he famously said a lot of things by the way, but two two things he famously said was one is that. Man, and he, and he talked about mensch, it's, it's German for, for the human race, is like a disease on the skin of the earth, which, which is very ecological. Um, and he also said that the meaning of the Ubermensch was the earth. You know, so he had a really, there's a profound kind of ecological impulse in Nietzsche, but not always a nice one. I mean, I don't, I don't want to present him as a saint. Um, he had there, there, you know, nature. I mean, he, he also thought while he walked through the mountains, literally, he didn't think at a desk. He thought as a at hiking through Switzerland and Italy and Germany. And, you know, he was outside a lot and basically just roaming around Europe for the remainder of his life because he couldn't hold down an ordinary job. He suffered tremendously, by the way, from all kinds of symptoms. And, we think that he actually died of a, uh, a cancerous tumor growing, um, growing behind his right eye, I think. So uh, there was another question kind of related to that. You might have already touched on it a bit, but I'm going to ask. This is from Ramses de Leon. Uh, he says, excellent presentation. What's your perspective on the possible merging point between digital enhanced transhumanism and the future of psy technology? Yeah, I know. These are just questions. I mean, you know, there's a there's there's of course biohacking and and um, the the popularity of of Nick Land and a kind of a kind of darker Nietzscheanism that you get in this transhumanist or posthumanist movement. Now, I'm really not doing that. I'm I'm really, you know, one of one of my real concerns about the humanities is that the truth always has to be depressing. You know, it's really good with with dystopias and apocalyptic futures, but we're very bad at imagining constructive and nurturing futures. And so I really personally don't align myself with those dark, apocalyptic, what I would call fantasies, um, that well could come true if we if we act on them. Um, so I I guess I'm I'm orbiting around these two questions. I think there's a real if you if you read an author like Nietzsche, what's so striking if you really read him and you don't just listen to people talking about him, he's so incredibly positive. He's so affirming. He's ecstatic about what he sees. Um, and I really want to focus on that yes saying, as he called it, and not on the the no saying. And a lot of the transhumanist and posthumanist literature, I think, is a lot of no saying, frankly. Um, and I'll also say this, 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 this will seem like a tangent, but I think <laughs> and it'll sound like really, um, my, I don't know what this will sound like. It's okay. You're allowed. Yeah. Well, but we're also, <laughs> we're also streaming. So I don't know what I'm allowed to do. Um, 
I, you know, this is, this is, I don't know if I, let me put it this way. I don't know if I really always trust a philosopher who hasn't raised a child. And what I mean by that is isn't that, you know, I want to privilege heterosexuality or, or the family or something, but if you've raised a child, you see how hopeful and for lack of a better word, how pure the human is at the beginning. And then of course, society just basically messes us up, you know, but there's something really beautiful and positive there that is so basic and so, so primary to human nature. And I think after you've raised a child, it's very, very hard to take a dystopian view of things. You know, you, you, you really feel responsible for the future in some ways. I, and not personally, of course, I, I, I don't have this fantasy I control the future, but we do as a generation. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think there really is something generative about this. Um, and the other thing I'll say about, and I, you know, I don't, I've never seen this talked about, but, but Nietzsche's Ubermensch is really interesting to me because it demands procreation. It works through biology and through multiple generations overcoming one another, basically. And that is just so distinct vis-a-vis -vis the history of religions where you get all kinds of superhumanisms, but they tend to be very much anti-sexual anti and anti-procreative. They tend to be celibate, frankly. Mm -hmm. So I, I really find Nietzsche's, Nietzsche's vision really interesting on that kind of biological or sexual level as well. Even though he did himself, of course, never, never had children. And yeah, I was. I, he, and I, he was yeah. kind of a mess. He was kind of a mess personally. Um, I, again, I'm not here to sanctify the guy. I'm, I'm just here to comment on his thought. Sure. Uh, we have a raised hand from Marilyn Schlitz, so I'm going to hand her the microphone. Hi, Marilyn. Hey, Jeff. This was great. I'm really grateful for your insights and. In particular, I want to celebrate that final piece that, oh, here, I think I'll turn my camera on so we can, um, the positive. And it's so easy to sink into the negative. And I just love the ebullience of that idea that, you know, in the midst of everything that's going on today, it's so easy to go down and to think about a philosophy of I want to go for the positive and I want to be that positive. That's a beautiful message. And then on my negative side, what about this Uberman Nazi kind of yeah. reading of the super person? And, you know, that seems like a serious shadow to all of this stuff. So anyway, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So let me deal with the Nazi thing first, because it, it's, of course, real. It, it comes up a lot. Um, so what happened? First of all, if you read Nietzsche, you'll see that he hates German nationalism and he mocks German nationalism constantly. Uh, he also mocks people who are anti-Semitic, which were, was very common in his, in his own Germany. So he hated, he hated both of those basic ideas. But his sister married a very famous anti-Semite or uh, anti-Semitic politician, and she took control of his legacy when he essentially went mad in 1889 and developed an ar the archive and basically sainted him. And she had a very close relationship to what became the Nazi party. And it was really her that passed on a very, very kind of specific cut version of Nietzsche for what became um, the National Socialist Party in Germany. Um, so that really happened. And of course, this is the reason that these ideas are generally pushed back on and generally rejected today. Um, but as I would argue, a badly used idea is not the same as a bad idea. I mean, Christianity has been used for <laughs> genocide and for devastating and decimating entire cultures and peoples. But you also get Martin Luther King Jr. and, you know, you, you get good people, you know, in, in the same tradition. So I think it's complicated. Um, I also think if you look at the American reception of Nietzsche in particular, you see that a lot of gender and sexual and 
race activists loved Nietzsche and they used him and they used him very effectively. Huey Newton, for example, who helped create the Black Panthers loved Friedrich Nietzsche. So, and it, and it's, it was because they read him, they didn't read him, they, they read him descriptively as someone who was analyzing the situation in very acute terms. They weren't taking all of Nietzsche, nobody does, but they really thought he was, he was spot on about a lot of things. So I just think, I just want to honor, I just think that complexity is there and it's, there are horrific moments in the reception of Nietzsche, including in Germany, but there are also really powerful moments of the reception of Nietzsche, um, particularly in the U.S. Um, so it's complicated. It's just like any great thinker, those ideas get picked up in really complicated ways. Um, and in terms of the positive, you know, so this is, I like to tell jokes and um, I often, you know, I like to think about when we're, when we, I, I assume when we're all kids, you know, we were asked this question, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I'll bet none of us ever said, I want to be a parapsychologist or I want to be a professor of religion, right? Mm -hmm. That would be one weird kid. Um, but what if we called our field the superhumanities? Who wouldn't want to grow up and be a superhuman? You know? And so it's, it's that kind of it's that kind of move that I'm trying to make here is we really need to, to be vulgar about it. we need to market this stuff very differently than we're doing because it's not boring and it's not it's not finally negative it, it has a very strong critique to it that's really important and integral but ultimately it's very positive um, and that's 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 what the project's about. Well, I just to shout out another little thing. I tweeted it just now. History makes no sense without accounting for these mystical states of consciousness. Another brilliant idea. And then just to throw in, and then I'm off. Um, I think of Phil Zimbardo's work on authoritarianism and his current work on heroic imagination. And I, I can see a lot of overlap for you know some fertile discussion there. I, okay, you know, thank you. Great to see you. Well, thanks, Marilyn. The other thing I would say there is this this often gets me into trouble, but I, I don't think mystical states are inherently moral. You know, I think they can go any number of ways. And but they're extremely powerful and they're extremely life-changing. Yeah, you know, take a near-death experience. It's you need trauma. You need to almost freaking kill someone to get a near death experience. What's what is morally good about that? But of course, it's 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 spiritual effects are often life changing. So I think I think this relationship is really complicated and I think we're kind of scripted in this culture to think that a an, a profound spiritual experience must be one of unicorns and rainbows. You know, it can't be one of terror and 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 death and transformation, which of course it often is. Um, so I, I I really want to move beyond that that niceness and, and sort of take things more where, where they're at rather than where we want them to be. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you. Okay, so we've got quite a few questions lined up. We're not going to have time for all of them. So I want to encourage our audience here to please use the upvoting feature um, to help me narrow this down a little bit. Uh, one question, though, because you were just touching on this a moment ago. Very, very straightforward question from Robert Schultz. Do you see parapsychology as a bridge between the humanities and the superhumanities? Yeah, yeah, I think it could be. Um, I, I think the way we order knowledge now in the university is we, you know, we have all the STEM fields, which get the money and the and the students now. And then we have the humanities over here, which nobody quite knows what they do. and Nobody quite cares, apparently. Um, but we don't have many bridges or ways to, 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 to combine them. And honestly, that's what we're trying to do at Rice now. So we're trying to develop fields like the medical humanities or environmental humanities. In other words, we're taking people who will go on to medical school or become environmental activists and we're, we're, we're making them really great historians and ethicists and thinking about narrative and, and, and interpretation. So we, we want to infuse, we kind of want to move towards forms of knowledge that really aren't just STEM 
or humanistic, but that is something something in the future. Um, but parapsychology, you know, it's still it's still verboten. It's it's taboo, and you know you can do it if you have tenure and you already have a position in a university, but you you can't go to your provost or your president and say, I want to hire a parapsychologist or I want to create a parapsychology lab. It just won't work. You know, the, the order of knowledge is such that it locks that out because it it fuses the mental and material in a way that I think just scares the crap out of people. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's a sign of its power and 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 of its frankly its its truth. Um, so yeah, I my hope is there. But again, I sit in the middle of a research university and I I see what that project's up against, and I don't I don't want to underestimate that. We're running out of time here, but I got one very popular question that I'd be in trouble if I didn't ask. Uh, this is from Michael Nam. Uh, he says, hi, Jeff, because the boundary between genius and madness is often very thin, I wonder how this might tie in with advancing parapsychology or science as a whole. Do we need a bit more madness in there? <laughs> oh, it's, it's, uh, it's, that's a tough one. I, you know, as a kid, I, I worked in a mental hospital. I, was, I, I wanted to be a, a monk, actually, and they sent us to this mental hospital in, in Kansas City to work every Saturday. And so I saw mental, serious mental illness up close. And you would sometimes encounter parapsychological phenomena, by the way, mm -hmm. among patients. So I, I think, the, I think the, the mental illness breaks down the ego in a way that's similar to the breakdown of the ego in mystical states, but I don't think it's the same thing, you know, in the sense that you can't, they can't get back. You know, the poor soul can't get back. Um, and so, yeah, if you're talking about madness in a metaphorical sense, of course we need more madness. We need more eccentric people, but truly mad, true madness or true mental illness is it is a tragic and horrible thing that that is really hard to watch up close um but it clearly is related here and and something i run up against constantly among readers and listeners is they want to say that this state is pathological or it's parapsychological in other words they they, they can't put those two together they can't imagine that well maybe real parapsychological phenomena appear in real pathology sometimes. Mm -hmm. I suspect they do. Um, and again, this goes back to the way we always want to make religious states moral and good. And I just, I just don't buy that. I just, I just think it's more complicated than that. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask one more question because it comes from the PA president. Okay. And speaking of getting in trouble. <laughs> so uh, this will be the last question today. Um, can you explain a little more why you are thinking that the paranormal is a kind of sacred, in quotations, a sacred in transit in the West? This is still intriguing for me. Yeah. So, yeah, um, I've called it that. Um, what you see in the 19th century is that the the, the British psychical researchers and then the French metapsychic um, tradition turns to categories like the supernormal or the paranormal as a way of taking what their ancestors would have called supernatural events and essentially naturalizing them. Um, and so you take the poltergeist as a real thing. Yeah, there things are bursting into flames and people are getting scratched and, and things are falling off shelves. Yes, that's real. But it's not about angry or loud ghosts in the room. It's about family conflict, or it's about an adolescent in severe emotional and sexual crisis who's manifesting this stuff unconsciously. And that's what I meant by the sacred in transit. It's, it's moving out of this supernatural register where you have this, this angry, uh, loud ghost in the room to know it's about, it's about family and sexual and emotional suffering. So it's it's naturalized and it's it it but it's still taking the phenomena as real. And that's what I mean. It's in transit. It's it's the interpretation is changing, 
but the phenomena remain identical. Um, and I think that's like part of what I'm calling the super story is it, it, it accepts these phenomena, but, but reinterprets them in a way that, that is quite striking sometimes. Um, and I think it plausible, very plausible. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us for this hour. And uh, congratulations you, again on your award. Uh, <laughs> do, I, do, I, do I get the award now, by the way? Or are you going to stick um, Yeah, it, we're going to have to count on the UPS or USPS <laughs> on this one to cross your fingers. All right. Uh, but, but it's on its way. Okay. Um, All right. And and uh, for we're going to be ending this session, and so the session will end soon on on YouTube. Uh, but in Arab Meet, we are going to stay uh, open for a bit. We're going to keep the social lounge open, uh, yeah. and hopefully, you can stick around for a few minutes to chat sure. with PA members um, for maybe some small group discussion. Uh, okay. So thank you again, everybody, for joining us, and uh, we'll see you in the social lounge. Thank you.